Hi guys, this is the first of a, hopefully a, a sort of series, depending on how this little pilot goes, um, of Alex and I, and potentially a few other people, just talking about some some fitness concepts, but also some ideas and thoughts around one element training, but also around uh, different aspects of training and maybe even delving into business at times as well. But I wanted to kick this off with a very old friend of mine called Alex, who's been training with us now for probably the best part of 13, 14, maybe even 15 years. Um, he's the longest trainer we've had. He's a dear friend. When I first got to know him, he was known as Alexander Alexos, the King of Balam. He's a skateboarding world champ. Well, not quite world champ, but certainly local champ. He's got the world record for deadlifts in Balam Gym, which is 100 kilo deadlifts for 50 reps. Correct me if I'm wrong, Alex, in a moment, but that that's an extraordinary, extraordinary achievement. He's a huge fan of Arnold Schwarzenegger. We may get onto that at some stage. <laughs> um, and I've just watched the documentary myself, which I thought was phenomenal. Really, really, really interesting. Um, there's a great bike story we might share with you at some point. But we, we, <laughs> Again. we won't get onto that on this particular one. Um, uh, he's He's got an encyclopedic knowledge of weight training. And that, for me, is why we're, we're starting with this particular vlog or podcast or however you want to consume it um and he's also a central figure at one element and he's been a central figure he's known by all the members and he's dearly loved by all the members so without further ado welcome alex to this first inaugural chat thank you tom very good to be here and, uh, and i'm really excited about talking this through because i'm not sure we've we've touched on it when we see each other but i'm not sure we've ever had a proper sort of in-depth discussion about really where we we both stand on on all of this you know it's big yeah it's a big subject um yeah. and so I think yeah we'll try and do with it what we can brilliant okay so what I, what I'm interested in talking about here is that we have these sort of fads if you step back and look at the history of uh sort of general zeitgeist or if you like the the sort of popular opinion of fitness training it's very much moved into, I think I can pretty clearly suggest three different areas. So in the late 90s or mid 90s, it was all about slow, steady date state cardiovascular fit tra fitness training, because that was what was known as fat burn. And we may come onto that at a different stage and, and both why that's based on a scientific fact and also why it's actually not as effective as high intensity training which has been shown to be much more effective at burning fat. But we'll come on to the ins and outs of that and how that works at another stage. Mm -hmm. uh, then in the sort of mid noughties to, I think it was about 2008 to about 2019, 18, 19, it was all about HIIT training, high intensity interval training. And again, everyone wanted to do this HIIT stuff. And over the last four or five years, I've noticed there's been a real push towards weight training. And this is based... I believe, on a kernel of truth, a bit like the cardiovascular training, the low intensity training that was in the 90s is now revolving around this weight training that we're everyone's talking about, the press are talking about. It is the thing to be doing if you're going to go to the gym. Any women's health, men's health magazine will say this is what you should be doing. And that kernel of truth is that uh, within weight training is that if you work your muscles if you do weights training you'll increase what's known as your basal metabolic rate so your your the amount of energy you're burning when you're at rest because you'll build bigger muscles so therefore you'll put up your metabolic rate for the rest of the day and perhaps the next day and so on and if you keep building muscles that's where this concept has come from but i've got a few problems with it um because i think that if you just say to people it's about weights training it's not about a kind of mixture of stuff it's not about the actual session and getting the intensity of that session up and perhaps using weights at the same time then all you're doing is getting people to go into a gym and maybe they end up doing a few bicep curls or a few bent over rows and what I'd like to talk to you Alex about is is kind of compound training why that's beneficial but why it also needs to be done properly um and and so, so that's my first thoughts what are, you, what are your thoughts Alex yeah it's very interesting I think I think that I think what's interesting is that back in the 70s, even in the 60s, 70s, um, when bodybuilding was coming out and becoming something that, that people, competitors got paid for, um, there was evidence even then that people with big muscles were strong. 
um, and because so few people were doing it, I think it was treated as a bit of a joke. You know, even when Arnold kind of broke out in 1974 and started getting publicity, um, you know, there were there were um, images in in the film Pumping Iron of Franco Colombo lifting a car up, and you know, Arnold was a strong man. He was deadlifting huge weights, you know. Um, which helped to build his physique, and yet, and yet, there was no crossover at that time into sport. I don't think so. It was still seen as, as sort of a bit weird, you know, these people getting huge muscles, and then um, it was very much about the aesthetics of it. And then I think very slowly, um, very slowly, there was a translation into sport. And actually, if you read some autobiographies, autobiographies of um, high-level sports people, one springs to mind, which is Andre Agassi, the tennis player was being put through long distance runs really as, as his physical training and then going onto a tennis court and not really having any significant ability to, you know, get better moving around the court. He was tired, you know, um, and then he, he met a coach who started actually doing specific strength training with him and developed machines that would actually adhere to the movements that they were doing playing tennis. And suddenly, bang, he, you know, he's moving better. He's doing all these things. And then if you look much more recently, you've got people like Andy Murray, who, if you watch the documentary about him, you know, he's doing banded lateral stuff, really hard sprints. He's lifting weights, you know, he's doing hip related movements and he's shoulder pressing. And, and I think that's part of it. And people started to go, hang on, these people are performing better, you know, and then sports people are talking about weight training as complementary, um, as complementary activity for their sport. Um, and then I think uh, that gained a sort of cultish thing much more recently in, say, things like CrossFit, where people were then going, actually, I want to be strong. I want to look strong um, uh, with a view to performance as well. So I think very quickly that the history of the history of weight training and muscle development um, has sort of come partly through through fad and fashion, but partly through kind of a basis in in uh, adherence to improve sporting ability definitely yeah i think that's a really i think you've summed it up brilliantly there a nice history of of how it's progressed through time but i would so to so two points there the sports specific training the andre agassi i mean we we all can see with hindsight that running long distance 10k runs for a tennis player is, is madness mm. what they need is agility and speed around the court and power in their shots and, and obviously a huge technical ball skill ability. Um, then, I mean, it, it got a similar thing in sports like rugby, which in when it went professional, uh, there was a huge thing about gaining weight and gaining, mm. gaining physical size, actually, not even yeah. necessarily sports specific. It was all about bulk and power and strength. Um, and I, I completely agree with you for these very specific sports. Absolutely. And then you also mentioned CrossFit. And whilst I'm not, a, I don't do CrossFit myself, I can absolutely see the, the attraction. I can see why lots of people love it. And I think it's actually in many ways very good. You're coached properly on how to do the, the movements as a general rule. And um, it's also quite high intensity. It's mm. not, I, my concern is that this message around weightlifting to the public is you go into a gym and you either use machines that are singular dimension or that you go into a, a, a weights room and do movements that maybe only work a certain specific muscles whereas if you can do the more compound movements the more movements that reflect our, our, our the, the way we would have moved before and the way that we want to move in the future and the way that we've evolved moving um, then you're going to get more benefits. But I also passionately believe that we need some element of... We, we One of the problems I have with this concept is it's taking fitness as a circle and just focusing on, on one tiny little patch of that fitness, whereas yes. I think that the benefits you get from um, cardiovascular fitness, and, and car even cardiovascular fitness is such a, a grey subject because it, it blends into a lactic fitness and then a strength and then a power Fitness, mm. where the lines are drawn is very different for different people um but i think building that is so good for your heart heart health lung health blood health but also your brain health and mm. the way we think and feel and i'm my concern with this complete uh focus and the reason i'm talking to you alex is because you're you're a weight 
trainer you're incredibly good at it you run our weights program at one element and i just want to yeah i just be interested in how you feel about this sort of press yeah. movement towards just just mm. weight yeah i mean i i i do agree um very much with the fact that they've it's been taken it's you know the people it's going to sell newspapers um you know here are four exercises that you can do and maybe they're all in one plane of motion um and interestingly that what we consider to be the basic exercises squats deadlifts lunges press ups they're actually incredibly technical um i think just the squat is if you were to describe a squat in its full detail it's nine paragraphs of instruction okay there's a lot going on there's there's hip joint and knee joint combination you know and how much you get of either affect moment arms which is a biomechanics discussion weight distribution through the foot what's happening in your lumbar spine in your thoracic spine what's happening in your core muscles there's a lot going on in a squat and it's thrown out as grab some dumbbells and do some squats you know um, one of the most important things about weight training is is technical ability and range of motion um, you can break it down into three things which is mechanical um, overload muscle damage and uh, metabolic stress and ideally when you're lifting weights you should be achieving primarily two of those um just sorry just alex just one while we're on that uh sorry let's run through each one of those and just give us a pithy uh overview of what each one means so you said overload metabolic stress um yeah metabolic stress would probably be talking about maybe a drop set protocol um short rest periods maybe fairly high volume moderate so weight higher so, intensity. So, yeah you're creating an effect in the body yeah. i mean and you know i think this is interesting because weight training i think i like to say aerobic training and resistance training rather than cardio you know you're if you do 20 heavy squats you know you feel like you've run 200 meters very fast it's the same effect on your heart your heart's yeah. thumping you're you know you're gasping for air you've created an oxygen debt so there's a big crossover in terms of, of of the health benefits to your cardiovascular system if you're weight training um so metabolic stress is is really to some extent a bit like high intensity interval training um creating that that stress through the whole body so so you're panting you know the uh the muscle damage is more akin to what you might call the burn so perhaps um slowing a movement down maybe with quite a lot of weight um you know stressing the muscle to a point where you are pretty close to an optimal fatigue um failure Maybe you might want to call it yeah and then um and then a mechanical overload maybe the stress through the joints and muscles so perhaps an eccentric load so like a stiff leg deadlift so where you're pulling weight from the floor without moving the knees and, and eccentrically loading so lengthening the muscle under stress um these things you know there is a big crossover there are three circles with a big chunk in the middle yeah um a bit like you know saying that this this particular exercise does this there is no best exercise you know there are there are exercises for different things and just to go back to your thing about uh, the weight training time i think you know people people body build and people go to to gain muscle but i i've always felt that while weight training i would say has been my primary focus in physical training physical health it's i very much see it as a complementary thing to me being able to run fast me being able to jump climb a tree jump over something cycle a long way pick something heavy up and tra- carry it over distance you know weight training has been complementary to me being able to do things yeah you know sporting hobbies having fun whatever it may be it's not a, a means to an end in itself it's always Absolutely. been a complementary thing to make me stronger, more upright, better, all these things. Yeah, I completely concede, concur, concur with you there. Um, so I'd just be really interested to know if if someone's list, still listening to this, a likely <laughs> scenario that anyone's still listening. I want to know from you, Alex, who who you must do your own fitness training, mm. you train alongside a lot of your your clients and I'd be really interested in you what a what a kind of week looks like for you as far as training is concerned how much of it is weight how much of it's cardio or, or aerobic if you like and uh how you structure a session as well so someone who's perhaps listening to this who's thinking 
yeah, maybe I should be doing some more weight training. Mm. What, what they would think about when they're going out to do it. And bear in mind, not everyone's a gym member. Some people may have some lightweights around the house, but some people may just be looking to do other stuff. So perhaps body weight stuff as well. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, it's interesting, actually, because obviously I've got a, quite a significant exercise history and weight training history. So I'm I'm what you would call I'm, I'm very well conditioned. So what I do now is is very different from what I would um, suggest a beginner did, probably in the way that I do it. But interestingly, my exercise selection now is hugely more simplified than it used to be. You know, I definitely fell into the trap when I started out. And obviously I was a a young man I had high levels of testosterone and growth hormone you know I was I'd pick up heavy weights and do high volume and I would grow um and whereas over the years you know the technical aspects uh range of motion as I said so moving a joint through its its full range as much as possible with good form um slowing the movements down to create time under tension to create stress in the muscle you know basically feeling that effect in the muscle you know taking it through its long and short ranges so you know from a full length to a its short length on the biceps for example or deep in a squat and taking time through the movement those are the most important things um there is a requirement for volume there's a requirement for weight to create stress but those have been proven to be much less important now than people thought they were you know you don't need to be chucking huge weights around to have an incredibly beneficial effect you know, I will sometimes go out and I'll just do a set of quality squat jumps close to failure. I might do 30 or 40. And the effect, the, the overall effect is incredible, you know, and I don't need to do too much of that. So nowadays, you know, with time, having less time available um, and, and fewer facilities available, you know, it's probably ideal. But I only really use... Um, a, a kettlebell or a couple of heavy-ish kettlebells really in some bands and I will as you touched on earlier I will do compound movements I'll do multi-joint movements so I will push weight from the floor which is using the more anterior parts of the body so it's using my quadriceps more obviously it's involving the core and then maybe I'll add a press into that so I will squat into a press uh, which is really hitting hitting legs core and shoulders and arms and I'll pull weight from the floor into a row so I'm exercising the posterior chain, so the, the hamstrings, the glutes, the back, and again, shoulders and, and upper back. And then I'll do single leg exercises, which I think are really important. So unilateral exercises such as lunges, so split squats with one foot in front of the other and going up and down, which also helps you with stability. So I'm really, I'm hitting my main muscle groups. Um, I will sometimes do some, do some arm work, but really I'm doing compound movements three to four times a week um my set protocols will be i will utilize short rest periods and smaller heavier sets and sometimes i'll go i'll go for high volume so i'll do back to back two or three exercises back to back to get me very tired to create that metabolic stress we talked about and then i will i say sprints i run fast over short distances probably two to three times a week yeah sometimes using inclines and in terms of higher intensity that's pretty much all i do you know i do cycle i do swim um i run around you know i go skateboarding but really i'm i'm I, it's very very simple it's very few exercises but it's done with a very intense amount of concentration yeah and we should move, we should move on to intent i think in uh, in muscles intent yeah. in movement um it's done with a huge amount of intent and concentration on what is what the muscle is doing and the, and the movement that I'm achieving and uh, and the feedback I'm getting from the muscles, really. Yeah. And, that, and that is the key. You know, these workouts yeah. don't last very long. No. So how long would they last? 20 minutes, Max. There we go. I, you know, uh, I'm just going to sum up what you've said and in, in what, what I'm hearing there. Mm. But, you know, for anyone out there who's not going to the gym because that for me going to the gym I'm, I've never been the biggest fan of gyms but you, you know you've got 20 minutes to get there you've got to change you've got to get into the gym you've got to work out you've got to get changed again maybe have a shower get home I mean it's it consumes a lot of time what you're saying is you can do this in 20 minutes yeah also you're talking about a lot of body weight work squat jumps uh perhaps lots of press-ups chin-ups if you've got a bar um light 
kettlebell weight work. But yes. What was really interesting on that chat that you've just given me was high repetitions. Now, I remember talking, chatting to Big Paul about high reps and how about how to gain muscle bulk or gain tone and gain strength. And I had been taught throughout my course, the, the sort of diploma and training that I did, was that kind of what they call hypertrophy. So building the muscle was kind of 10 to 12, maybe 14 reps. And he said, no, no, no. The, the guys who train hard and get big muscles, they're doing 25 to 30 or 20 to 25 reps at like complete fatigue at 25 reps. Yeah. And that's how you build muscle. And he, he explained it that what you're doing is you're depleting the muscle of its glycogen, of its uh, adipose triphosphate. And then over the next 24, 48 hours, you need more gly glycogen and adipose triphosphate. But the key there is to store those energies. You need more water in the muscle. So the water has to come into the muscle so you store more energy. But the other great bonus is you're then storing more vitamins, more minerals, more of all the goodness that we have in our body. These They're basically just packages of holding health, aren't they? I mean, they're, they're, yes. they're holding a lot of your the the good stuff that we need when we're unwell exactly. throughout the day so yeah they're your they're your storage facility yeah for for glycogen you know they're your primary metabolizer so you are when you're training you're sort of emptying a cupboard if you like of mm. stuff and you're leaving it wide open and you can just then shove and stuff into it and fill and it up a again aspect, a big aspect of that is water and one yeah. really important thing is that we 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 don't actually get any more muscle we just access more of the muscle we've got so it, when you see someone with huge muscles they haven't got more muscle than anyone else well they, they've got as much as they originally had they've just accessed more of it and then yeah. in a very simplistic term they've got more water into it because they need more energy in that water so that they can perform the movements that they're consistently doing so if you want to build big muscles or you want to tone up more you need to up your rep range so that that it, that really simplified explanation comes into effect yes i think um you, you do you do need to achieve a certain level of fatigue i mean i think that that's that that's the main bit of research that's really really changed things is yeah going away from from weight um and there is a there's probably a minimum weight i think it's maybe about 20 percent of your one rep max so if your maximal amount of weight you could pull from the floor is 100 kilos you know if you're training with 15 kilos on deadlifts you're probably not going to be able to achieve a significant amount of growth but if you were doing it with 30 and you were doing very high reps and you're getting to a point of extreme fatigue um then you probably could and you know so your percentages could be 30 percent 80 percent as long as you're kind of ending up at the same end point of fatigue then you're probably yeah. going to grow and you're achieving micro micro tears across the um the muscle fibers and you're also wanting to to achieve achieve time for the the muscle sarcomeres to basically sort of rub against one another if you like or to be be put under that amount of tension yeah so that you're, you're that, achieving that this. raised another thing i need to talk about but i'll come back onto that in a moment because i want to cover off the things you you explained at the beginning uh compound training so for those who don't know what compound training is it's using a, it's just basically more than one muscle movement it's yeah, if you've got anything to add to that do but just to move quickly it's okay mm. something like a chin up or a clean would be a compound movement from the ground up to your chin um and also, I would add to that, like working your legs and then working another part of your body. So the great benefit of working your legs is you release more testosterone because these are bigger muscle groups, yeah. which will then have a, a beneficial effect on other parts of the body. So if you want to build bigger shoulders, for example, or bigger, bigger biceps, you, you need to go through a squat set, a deadlift set, and then focus on those because you'll get the benefits of, of the testosterone released from the legs. Yeah. Into and also body. yeah absolutely and also you know exercise selection is is important to a point you know if you're if you're wanting to you know develop your quads then you're going to maybe prioritize them as your first exercise or you're, and you're going to get onto the the most important sets earlier on um you've got to think about you're potentially fatiguing the whole body but yeah there is definitely a global effect from training the bigger muscles so you know if if you do deadlifts um squats and lunges you know you're, you're still going to to get better muscles on your upper half you know it's still working you're you might be holding a bar 
there's there's um, isometric stress through other muscles you know they're supporting and stabilizing you even if they're not working yeah but right. definitely sort of bang for the buck you know this whole thing men are probably guilty of of you know training the bit that you might be able to see so the arms yeah these are very small muscles your biceps is <laughs> it's a two-headed you know it's a small two-headed muscle so standing yeah. around doing bicep training you'd be much better off like you say doing chin-ups which are also benefiting your biceps hugely but also you know working your back and your shoulders yeah. as well so i think there is yeah multi-joint movements are the way forward so now bodies are designed you know for lots of things to be working at the same time it's 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 not a movement that translates into everyday life really to be standing doing yeah. curls there's nothing wrong wrong with isolating a muscle group and probably something like uh, your you know your calf muscles your gastroc and your soleus muscles are, it's quite important to do that because they're lifting your body weight all the time it's a very strong group of muscles but they're really moving through a very small range if you look at how much you lift up when you walk and how much your toes are up when you heel strike you know there's very very little happening so strengthening that muscle yeah. through a bigger it's range just, just for layman he's talking about your calf here so this is the the, the calf muscle yes and it is it is apparently it can lift nine times your body weight because it yeah, it's incredibly strong loads of power of muscles. and yet the only time most people train it is when they go for a run so you doing those and like particularly as you just alluded to that eccentric work so eccentric means when the muscle is getting longer under tension so if you you're coming you want to come up so you're onto your tiptoes and then slowly all the way down past past the horizontal on a step if you can yes increasing the strength through the muscle yes um, there's two more things i want to cover alex before we wrap up but firstly range of motion i i think this is actually one of the quick wins that anyone can do if they're weight training yeah um range of motion and and coming back to that eccentric work so if you mm. can for example you mentioned split squats earlier which is where you have one leg for, it's like a lunge position but you're you're not lunging backwards and forwards you keep the front foot forward you keep the back foot back now most people doing a split squat will take their back knee down to about halfway to the ground and back mm. up mm. if you do if you do 10 reps on each leg even if without any weight but bounce the knee into the ground you won't damage your kneecap just let the ground let it hit the ground and come back off it yes and change the legs and do 10 more and perhaps build some weight into that trust me you will get doms you'll get soreness the next day and you'll know that you've been doing some good on the on the range of motion so i completely if you've got anything to add to range of motion please do yeah. i've got quite a lot actually but i'll <laughs> keep it <laughs> Yeah, it's in, it's probably one of the most important things because as we as we have said, we we default to our strongest position. So if you a good example, I think, is if you went to try and push a car, you know, if you've got ever broke or help someone push a car, if you get into the position to push that car and you know you're going to need a lot of force, if you then look at what you've done with your arms and legs, you'll find that they're almost all at 90 degrees, which is the strongest position for the muscle. You've automatically defaulted. To the place you can produce most power and so what we do is and um, what people sometimes do in the gym is they will they will lift weight that's too heavy and they can only really manage it in that mid-range and so what you're you're losing you, you know you're you're basically building on something that you've already got what you want to be trying to do is is create the strength of the end ranges okay so as i as i briefly mentioned earlier a muscle is is weak when it's long okay and it's even weaker when it's when it's short in this position. So moving through a range of motion will train that muscle. So it'll be better for the muscle, but it'll also help to protect you because injuries tend to happen. You know, if you look at hamstring injuries, you look at calf injuries, when that muscle is put under force in a weak position, that's when things happen. So if you can train it to be stronger in those in those places, then uh, then absolutely. it's absolutely fantastic. And eccentric loading, yeah, eccentric loading is basically lengthening the muscle under force so if you're lowering towards the floor so if you're in a squat as your knee is going into flexion it, as it's bending your quadriceps in the thigh are getting longer and weaker so if you can slow down the amount of time they're having to be create force in their weaker position you're going to get huge benefits because fewer fibers are being used in an eccentric contraction so you're going to get more much more bang for your buck exactly or a press up going right to the ground or... exactly slow slow and as it's getting harder spend more time yeah. in it you know always I mean, the amount try of people, and keep 
you see in the gym who do chin ups from here to here. Exactly. Coming all the way down to here, which is where you actually get the strength gained. Exactly. Yeah. Like I like I just said, in this in this position, you are strong. And so yeah. everyone's just doing this. But of course, if you can pull from here, fantastic. Absolutely. Brilliant. Finally, to wrap up, because I think someone we, we need to give the zoom over to someone else, but uh, micro tears in the muscle fibers. Just I'm just going to give you a pithy overview of what's happening here. So you've got little hairs on the muscle fibers. And as you put them under tension, some of them tear. And this is on a, a seriously tiny scale. Yes. But if it happens to enough mu muscle fibers, you wake up the next morning and you feel stiff and achy. And I think this is something, I know this is something from friends and family who have done it. It can put people off training in the future. Um, if you could quickly say, if you've got anything to add to that, then if you could tell me uh, what, what to avoid to get too bad muscle. You don't want too many DOMs. You don't want to be put off completely. And also why DOMs are a positive thing. Over to you, Aidan. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, a post-training effect or, or the DOMS you spoke about, I think is it's not absolutely necessary. You know, I often say to people, you do not need to be in significant pain after a workout to have to have been productive in that workout. You know, I, I like to think I still train fairly hard. I rarely get really bad significant DOMS, um, but I'm absolutely benefiting from it. Um, and I think, you know, if, if I have a break for a week or two, I will, I will feel it. Um, but yes, it's, it's not a bad thing. I mean, you don't, you don't want on a regular basis to be in a position where it's difficult to stand up or sit down or to move, you know, that you've probably either gone too heavy, you're not training consistently enough, your exercise selection is poor, you know, this, this can get more complicated, but some, some soreness, is not a bad thing at all. I think it's just got to be managed. You know, there are times you would you would regulate training and sometimes really go for it and be a bit sore, but you don't want every single workout to be like that because the chances are you're probably experiencing some sort of overload, which maybe isn't great for you or for your joints. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's 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 management of that DOMS. It's it's an interesting yeah. one because it's very factor dependent on experience consistency and yeah. and what you're doing I, I, I do think form 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 technique and range of motion are really important and i i still get a fantastic effect you know and i particularly find this if i'm demonstrating an exercise to someone because you're really thinking about doing it correctly i can lift light weights and still get incredible effects in the muscle mm -hmm. you really do not need to be throwing heavy things around but you do need to be thinking into the muscle and focusing on the range of motion and technique absolutely Brilliant. Well, I think just to sum up on that one, then, Alex, I, I mean, basically, it's it's doing it consistently is what I'm hearing there. Get, if you can, if you're doing your your training every week, two, perhaps two or three times a week, you're less likely to get the, the delayed onset muscle soreness. But pushing into that, changing perhaps rep range, weights, amount yes. of weight that you're using will drive it up a bit. But actually see this as a positive. See this as something that's that's good, provided you're still able to move. See it, it as something that's building new muscle, building more energy, you're getting strong, you've accessed more muscle fiber, and you're generally going to be getting those all those benefits that we talked about at the start around uh, basal metabolic rate, more strength, more movement, more power, and so on. So yeah, so in, in short, a, a good thing. Oh, an amazing thing. It's incredibly important um, to have you know, fit, contractile, skeletal muscle um it's probably for another day and also insulin sensitivity which we touched on with the glycogen i think the idea of being insulin sensitive is you know incredibly important particularly in this day and age with you know the problems with obesity and weight training is is a huge factor in in um, fit muscles um will make you incredibly insulin sensitive and therefore you know you've got storage facility for yeah. for glucose you know for yeah. anything else you take on they, they're serious. I mean, there's so much evidence now that uh, type two diabetes can be reversed with yeah. a mixture of, of aerobic, carb cardiovascular, and weight. Yeah. and it's yeah. really exciting how yeah how as a as a as a longevity factor, as a as a primary health marker, um, training muscles is probably the ultimate thing you can do. Or, you know, training muscles in many ways, but resistance training specifically, loading a muscle. With weight okay, repetition. so we started off with the, the premise that perhaps weight training isn't the be all and end all. 
But we've really dig, dug deep, I think. Uh, we could dug, dig a lot deeper, and I'm sure we will in the future on chats. But I think you're, you're actually, where I've come to on this conversation is weight training is hugely important and a vital part of a really good mixed training session. I think yes. you don't have to go out there and do an hour's training session. You don't have to go out there and do a 15-minute warm-up and have a 10-minute stretch at the end. You've got to accept you're going to get a bit of delayed onset muscle fiber soreness. Do a 20 minute to 30 minute training session. You can do it in your garden. You can come to one element. You can join Alex for his one on one sessions or his group sessions. I think that what I'm taking away from this is that it is an important. It's a hugely important aspect of, a, of an overall fit and, fit and strong uh, mentality. But it's not the, the only thing that should be in the in the mix. No, it, it, should, it shouldn't be the only thing. It should it should be. Uh, it's important for everybody, though. I don't think any any sports person now, and I mean any sports person um, at, at a high level, doesn't use complementary strength training. It's as simple yeah. as that, um, you know. And actually, anyone who's senior, anyone who's middle aged, anyone who's yeah. in their early twenties should be doing some sort of weight training. Yeah, and we may come, I'll be really interested to talk to you about uh, why muscles get injured at some point. I've got my own views on this, mm. uh, and I. I, I swing to the, the side that they're they're overstretched and perhaps too weak. As yes, the the other way around, which is too short and too strong. But we it would be worth having that conversation another time. But I think um, we've got we've got to pass over to someone else to use this uh, platform, and hopefully we we we've got that one person is still listening and will be up for another episode in the future. Alex, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, anyone who listened. Uh, and chat soon. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Cheers, buddy. Okay.